Thank you very much, Hania, for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for giving up some of your afternoon to be here today. Um, right, let me just go into present mode. Um, I won't reintroduce myself, because Hania did a, a lovely job of that, so thank you very much. Um, so this afternoon, I want to talk to you about three key things, which is technology, content, and live experiences. And the, the combining theme of those three elements are I think they're all digital or they're all career elements that won't change too much. They won't be disrupted too much over the next 5, 10, 15 years. So essentially, they're all trends that I think will continue to be of importance to you and your careers uh, and to the world at large. And to start and set the context, I've got a glass half full, glass half empty scenario and I'm going to deliver the bad news first. So an Oxford University study very recently found that up to half of all jobs in the US are going to be disrupted and digitized in the next 10 to 20 years. That's a large amount of the workforce and the economy that are going to be struggling because their machines and software will be doing their jobs that humans would have been doing. It's kind of a scary prospect and alarming statistic, um, but one that's very real. And so just to give you a kind of concrete example of this, you know, 10 years ago, if you were a taxi driver in the States or in London, if you're a black cab driver, you wouldn't really have thought your job was at risk for much. You had kind of had a job for life, even though you were largely self-employed, you could get a good income from it. And then seven years ago, this guy in the States, Travis Kalanick, thought up an idea called Uber. And really, it's not an obvious idea because, you know, getting a taxi isn't that difficult in major metropolitan cities, and yet he thought it was. And despite the taxi industry being heavily regulated and having very strong unions, Uber's gone from city to city and strength to strength, disrupting what was seen as a very stable industry, destroying, in some cases, many people's livelihoods while making Travis a lot of money. Um, at this point, Uber's, uh, at the last time I checked, Uber was worth well over 60 something billion dollars. This is for a seven year old company. He's, his net worth is over six billion dollars. It's over a billion dollars a year. Like that's pretty good. And yet there's a lot of people who are now not making any money, right? So this is the bad news. This is the bad side of technology disruption. Oh, going the wrong way. On the good side of technology, it does create an awful lot of new opportunities. It's a brave new world. New skills are available all the time. New knowledge is needed at all times to, to work in these jobs. So if you kind of start with a digital first mentality, actually there's a huge amount of opportunity. And these jobs in the digital economy tend to be better paid, higher skilled jobs. So this is a, um, taken from a study by the, um, by UK, sorry, the London Tech City, uh, which is a, an East End initiative run by the government that shows that digital jobs pay better, on average £50,000 as a salary. So that's not bad, and this is the good news. And again, taking Uber as an example, I was speaking at a, a content marketing talk last year, uh, and they very kindly paid for me to get an Uber back to where I live, which is about an hour away. Um, and it was great for me as a user because I didn't have to have any cash, I didn't have to worry about tips, I just took care of it on the account. And as I got speaking to this Uber driver, you know, he couldn't praise the company enough. It had given him an opportunity he wouldn't have had to be employed on his terms, making a better living than he would have given any of his other previous options. So for him, Uber was a great thing. And so, really, the point of this kind of opening, uh, opening five minutes is to say that disruption is a fact. You know, the evolution of technology is not good or evil. It's not inherently a moral thing. It is a fact of life. It's going to happen. And there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers on every, at every kind of point of disruption. And I think the key for all of us is to make sure that we are constantly moving forward and reinventing ourselves as fast as the world reinvents itself. And that's kind of the crux of this talk. So, 
With that introduction, I want to talk a bit about my journey to digital because I didn't start as a digital marketing manager for Eventbrite. I then want to talk a little bit about what my job is today, then why I'm backing the idea of in real life versus digital. Uh, essentially, this is what my company does and this is why I think they're a good bet. Disp so basically, analog or live experiences in a world of digital. And then I want to talk very briefly about some of the tools of the trade that I use day to day and that you may well be familiar with, you may not. Uh, and then finally, a very brief thought on the future. So my journey to digital. I obviously didn't sit as a five-year-old and dream of being the head of content marketing for Eventbrite UK in Ireland, surprisingly. I dreamed of being a pilot, ideally a fighter pilot, because it sounds cool. Um, and also, my neighbour across the road really wanted to be an airline pilot, and he was three years older than me, and I really looked up to him, so of course that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do that for a good number of years, actually, until I realised I didn't have 20-20 vision, and I was a little bit too tall to be in a cockpit of a fighter pilot plane. And so I kind of thought, hmm, maybe this isn't a career for me. And then obviously through teen years, I changed every six months what I wanted to do, from being a lawyer because I read lots of John Grisham books through to being a criminologist because I watch lots of um, TV, I guess. Um, and so, you know, when I entered university, I really had still no idea what I wanted to do. The only thing I knew that I was kind of good at was, um, in particular, was writing. And so I did a degree, actually not in journalism, not in marketing. I did, po I did politics and philosophy because it interested me. Really, that's, that was the only overriding idea behind choosing that degree that I took. Uh, and also it gave me a chance to do an exchange program in the US, uh, which was the other deciding factor, and, uh, and that was pretty cool. And then three years down the line, at the end of my university degree, I still had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and kind of six months to go, everyone's talking about careers and doing open days and that kind of stuff, and I thought... What, what's the best career for me? Again, I kind of fell back to the idea that I'm a very good writer, so why not go into journalism? Only when I looked to my left and I looked to my right at the people that were going into journalism and potentially getting offers, they'd all spent three years building a portfolio of work while I'd not. Um, I'd been gracing the student union bar a little bit too much. And so I realised I wasn't going to be competitive, really, um, against all these incredibly smart, incredibly driven um, future journalists. And I also looked at what the salary would be, and that didn't excite me either. Um, sorry to anyone who is wanting to go into journalism, but you know, I realised it wasn't going to be a career that made a ton of money, and that was kind of interesting to me after being poor as a student for a number of years. Um, so I actually knocked the idea of going into journalism on the head, and like so many people, I just fell into my career. I answered a call on, uh, on I think it was called Mill Crown at the time, I don't know if that's still around, for a job in London that basically read, do you want to be a mini CEO? We will give you a budget and you can go away and create these cool events and you will manage the P&L, the profit and loss account, uh, and you will make good money if you do well. And that was really exciting. I thought, great, I do not want to be a cog in a big machine. This sounds like I'm going to get a lot of, um, you know, a lot of leeway to, to try new ideas and be innovative right out of university, so I'm going to go for this job. And in fairness, it was pretty close to the job description. Um, it did give me a lot of flexibility. It taught me a huge amount of thing, uh, you know, a huge amount of skills around marketing, around operations, around live events, uh, around content and dealing with people and selling stuff. Um, it was really, really a great learning experience. And from that job, I moved into more senior uh, management management roles in a, another events company. And I'll be honest, it was a great career. Like for the first five, six, seven years uh, out of university, it really was, you know, it g gave me an opportunity to make that money that I wanted to do, to travel the world. I got to live in New York for a year to, to open an office out there. Um, you know, this, this live events world was superb. But then as I progressed and I managed more people and I got closer to just dealing with budgets, I started to become less happy. It just wasn't as interesting anymore. I wasn't really dealing with people as much anymore. I was really just doing man management and answering whether we'd hit, uh, hit 100% or over 100% on our budgets. And that's not very inspiring, right? You don't want to wake up every day thinking, just did I hit this quota? Did I hit this budget? Did I hit this KPI? 
And so I became a little disenfranchised with what I was doing. And I started reading a lot of tech press. So does anyone, everyone know like TechCrunch, for example? TechCrunch, maybe? Yeah. So there's, there's a, a bunch of publications like Wired and TechCrunch that really, they're, they're great publications. I'm not so much a fan of TechCrunch anymore, um, but at the time it seemed like the best thing ever. And they introduced me to this world of entrepreneurship, proper tech entrepreneurship, going out and trying to build a business from your bedroom. Uh, and that really appealed to me. No longer would I have any restraints. No one tell me what to do. I could be my own man. I could live the entrepreneurial dream, you know, maybe become the next Mark Zuckerberg. And so without any real, again, without any real warning, I quit my job and I decided uh, I was going to build a business. So I learned to program. I did a 10 week crash course and I learned how to code the front end. So that's HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then the back end. I learned Ruby on Rails uh, as a programming language. And I set about trying to build this site. Um, and let me show you what that was. This is a very brief introduction to it, which now makes me cringe. Have you ever missed out on a business event that you really wanted to attend? Perhaps because of workload or budget reasons? Conferences where the major decision makers help to set new trends, define what's important, and share their hard won lessons. Events where important presentations get delivered that can impact your day to day work. Well, now you don't have to feel like you're looking from the outside in. We can help you stay connected with all the most important business events that you can't make. With Savvy, you can get the same access to the premium conference content as those who are there, absolutely free, from the comfort of your own desk. Simply sign up and you can access all of our business videos taken from some of the world's leading conferences and business events. You can vote your favourite videos, join in the conversation, and learn more about upcoming events that you may want to attend in person. Savvy is a social business media platform designed to meet the needs of busy professionals like you so you can stay on top of industry trend. With new videos and events added regularly, isn't it time you sign up for your free account? Do you guys want to run out and sign up for it? <laughs> Not enough people did, unfortunately. Um, so there's two things that really made me cringe about that. One is the terrible design, uh, which I did myself, and uh, the other is the, the kind of description, the tagline for it, social business media networking, I can't even remember it myself anymore. Like, what, did, what did that do? Um, so just to tell you the idea behind the, the business idea, I don't think it was a terrible one. Um, so essentially talks like this happen all over the world every day um, in, you know, in just about every country and very, very, very few of them are recorded. And those that are, nothing happens with the videos. Maybe they're uploaded to YouTube, um, which is then often in an unlisted way and it's very difficult to find them and search for them. And so there's lots of great knowledge, maybe today notwithstanding, that's being lost, I think. And so what I wanted to do was kind of amalgamate the idea of TED and YouTube and create a very simple searchable database of all the business talks that are happening around the world. And I was hoping, based on that great idea, I'd be able to find some way to commercialize it, whether it's kind of a Spotify model to, um, you know, pay, people paying a monthly license to have an all-you-can-eat access to all these business videos, or paying for them on demand, or potentially a lead generation idea. I bumped around all of them. And over 18 months, I learned a lot. You know, I learned to code, I learned bad design, uh, I learned how not to pick a co-founder. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, I, the most exciting, exciting day, of course, of that 18 month to two year period was making my first sale. Like that was epic. It was something like five pounds, but it felt amazing to have made money off my own back, even though I could have you know, made five pounds so much easier uh, doing something else. But that, that was kind of a big moment for me. Um, and it did finally start to build momentum. Um, but at that point, having invested nearly two years with no salary uh, and, and all that time and money and effort into it, my life changed absolutely fundamentally. Um, why is that not moving on? There we go. With Bethany, the arrival of my first daughter. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, what a life-changing moment. Um, and of course, at this point, I really needed to be earning a salary to support the family. And so from that point, I kind of thought, you know, what? I've given this entrepreneurship a good go. I'll definitely dive back into it in the future, and I will. Um, 
But for now, I'm going to kind of put a pin in it. I've had a good go. It's not quite making the money that I hope to. And, uh, and um, you know, it's time to move on. And I'm super glad I did because, you know, just six months ago, I had my second daughter um, in the basis of a nice, stable job. And so these are kind of some of the things that, like, boiled up over the, over the last 10 or so years since I left university. I wanted to make money. I did. Uh, and I still do. I wanted to do work that I took pride, you know, I take pride in, and that that's something that I'd lost, and I really wanted to get back. I want a work-life balance. I don't want to work all hours. I want independence. I want. I like the chance to to manage people and uh, be in a leadership position and make decisions. I am entrepreneurial, and I hate being told what to do with a passion. So you know, needed need something that I can define my own role. Um, I'd like to think I'm quite creative, and I like to be in creative roles. Uh, I am commercial though as well, and I always like that balance. And then technology is cool, it's fun, it's interesting, it's always changing, so I wanted to work with technology. And that's where the kind of dots connected and how I ended up in this current role at Eventbrite. It offers all of those things, all of the above, which is pretty cool to find a job that offers all of those things. And I'm, you know, I'm super happy here, I've been working for Eventbrite for two years now. And just, you know, in this last section, if you haven't seen this video, I'm not going to play it because it's 15 minutes long, but if you haven't seen it, go to YouTube and check out Steve Jobs' Stanford commencement speech. It's fantastic. And if you want to talk, he's the guy that talks about connecting the dots. You know, you have to make decisions and have faith that they will work out someday, even though you can't quite figure out how that will happen. Obviously, it worked out, things worked out for Steve extremely well, um, you know, while he was still alive, of course. Um, and you know he's he's just had such an impact on the world, and yet you listen to his commencement speech and you realise so many things along the way. He didn't plan; he just did because they felt right to him at the time, or they happened to him and they didn't feel good at the time. But they all made him the man that he was and shaped the company that he built, which of course is Apple. And so I highly recommend 15 minutes of your time to go and watch that. I watch it every few months, and it just uh, just really makes me think and grounds me. Uh, about you know what the future holds for us all. Okay, so that's a little bit about how I got into the, this position. So now I just want to take a little bit of time to talk about what it is that I do. Again, setting the context. I feel like I'm battering journalism even though I've never worked in the industry, but <laughs> um, it has gone through a rough time, right? All the traditional revenue streams pretty much that it could count on have somewhat disappeared over the years and unfortunately it's it's very very hard to get a full-time job as a journalist now to get paid well for it is even more difficult and to work as a freelancer is extremely difficult um, so you know journalism as a as an industry it's certainly not dead not by any stretch of the imagination i'm a huge advocate of good journalism and great content i hope it continues to find ways to progress and move and thrive but this is how it's felt over the last few years as it's been disrupted time and time and time again, primarily based on free content. And that free content, in a lot of respects, was supported by the traditional digital marketing, um, which was banner ads, right? These terrible, horrible, disruptive experiences that flash in your face uh, on websites. That's what was paying for journalism um, for a long time, and that's what digital brands were spending the bulk of their money on banner ads, banner ads, banner ads. And, it, you know, to begin with, they were very effective, but over time, people become banner blind, right? And so this is a heat map that shows that people just fundamentally able to ignore banners after a while. Like they just don't even appear on your radar. Um, and then on top of that, there's now a ton of ad blocking software that you can have, which will mean that actually you just don't see them full stop. And so that kind of traditional digital marketing, what we'd call uh, outbound marketing in, in some, some circles, isn't really a very viable one anymore. And so these kind of two things have mixed together where businesses are now saying that content is king. And a lot of journalists have gone to write for corporates and businesses and, and kind of ply their trade, but within a corporate setting rather than a, a newspaper. And it really has become king. And a lot of corporates, and this is my job really, which is to, to create 
content that is good enough to rival other magazines and publications and through that people will find us so they will find Eventbrite or they will find other com any of the companies that you care to mention through this great content learn more about them and it's called and this is called an inbound model so instead of putting banner ads everywhere to try and attract people back to you and spending all that money you're creating great content um, and people are coming to you right that's the kind of fundamental idea problem is you know as with everything you know it's it starts to get ruined as people find out it works and it gets more popular there's too much content so there's a couple of um, key points uh, two years ago I think it was now Mark Schaefer who's a, a bit of a thought leader in content marketing um, wrote a blog post that just went absolutely wild and viral within that community called content shock and this is the idea that there's just too much content being published like we just cannot remotely filter it we can't take it all in there's just too much content and then in the UK a guy called Doug Kessler who runs a great content marketing agency um, also published this um, slide share called the content uh, the content marketing manifesto and it's all about avoiding crap content basically like stop just publishing stuff for the sake of it actually create meaningful content so the answer to crap content and content shock and a deluge of content is meaningful content. And what does that mean? So in my, in my mind, this is my definition, meaningful content, firstly, it has to be valuable, right? It has to do a job in the minds of the reader. Usually that comes down to two things. It either entertains them and it's fun or it's funny, shareable, people want to... Uh, you know, it makes people laugh and it makes people want to share it with their friends or it's educational, it helps them answer a question or it makes, you know, perhaps it's a resource or a template that makes their job a little, a little bit easier and then it needs to be unique there's no point creating a bunch of me too content that just copies other content that's out there, out there that answers the same questions in roughly the same way that entertains in roughly the same way you know, it has to be different, it has to be unique, you have to not find it anywhere else. And if you can create uniquely valuable content, then to me, that's meaningful. That will cut through the clutter, that will help people find your content and actually appreciate it and not feel like they're, they're in, this, uh, in the midst of this content shock. And then good content marketing laid on top of that, this is the business aspect of creating meaningful content. So for me, it's creating this great content that drives business results and helps influence behavior in a defined way. So influencing behavior in a defined way is effectively what marketing is. And for me, content marketing is, is, is that branch of marketing um, that helps deliver business results. So this is kind of what I do every day. And it's not just trying to create viral hits or you know, looking at pictures of cats. It's kind of a fun element of it, but it's not, it's not you know, the crux of what I do. Um, there's two, two main elements, really, to what I do day to day. So the first is a creative side of things. So, you know, I get to write a lot, which is great. A little less as, the, as my team's gotten bigger and other people do more writing so I can focus on the strategy and that kind of side of the stuff. But um, I do get to write a lot, which is great. Um, just fun little things like picking the photos that go with the blog, like little things that make your day a little bit fun and creative. Still get to do those kind of things. I come up with the content strategy, so that's setting the calendar. That's part creative, part analytical. Um, I get to, and then so, so on the analytical, analytical side of things, I spend probably more of my time on this now than I do on the creative side of things. Um, but. I spend a lot of time looking at Google Analytics, I spend a lot of time with spreadsheets and research tools, things like Google Keyword Planner, uh, BuzzSumo, I'll go into some of these tools in a, li a little later in the talk, to really try and understand what is going to work, what is going to be effective content from a business perspective. And this is really where the, the two kind of meet together, and this is why I really enjoy my job, because you can, these tools are available to everyone, so everyone could end up coming to the same solution and the same idea and the same content to publish, but it's not. 
Because actually you need an instinct, you need gut feel, and you need some creativity when it comes to content marketing. And that only comes from experience and, and kind of having an, an eye for your craft, I guess, and the journalistic aspect kicks in. So, you know, I love the, the, the combination of the two. So I use a lot of data and a lot of research and a lot, lot of analytics to set the strategy and define what content we should be publishing, but all with this, this hint of creativity. And that's what sets us apart. And, you know, the content marketing program at Eventbrite has been really, really successful. You know, it's been adopted globally. Um, you know, it's driving a lot of traffic, a lot of interest in the product. It's helping us grow here in the UK. Um, and so really the results have shown and vindicated the approach that I've taken to content marketing day, day to day. And then just a little bit about, so IRL is our shorthand for in real life. So in real life versus digital. I don't know whether this is a question people think very much, but you know, I certainly did when I was looking to join Eventbrite. It's kind of like, well, do people still need real life connections, real life experiences? And actually in the conference industry where I'd worked before starting my own business, it was really difficult to get people to conferences. It just felt like it got more and more difficult every single year. So it was a really pertinent question in my own mind, like can real life still be important in a digital age when everyone can connect with everyone else through Skype, through Facebook, etc., etc. And so obviously my answer is I think yes, it is important. And so, you know, cast your mind way, way, way back to 10,000 BC before any of those tools were around. And you think if you were, you know, a caveman at the time, like, how would you know that there was good hunting somewhere or that there was danger around the corner? Really, all that exchange of information, that where society was first born, born was around a campfire. It was around a fire in a cave, and it was like the first elements of a rudimental event, right? It's people gathering to exchange important information, build trust with one another, and understand what was going on in the world around them. And that was an incredibly important aspect of society's growth, that, that personal exchange of information for the next 10, 12,000 years, really right, right up until 10, 20 years ago with the birth of social media and the internet, did that exchange of information became, become considerably easier without meeting face-to-face. -face. And so face-to-face -face meetings are ingrained in our human psyche. You know, that's how we've evolved uh, right, this is a quick, uh, a quick um, answer question. So I'm going to show you three photos and see if anyone can um, tell me what, why they're related. So this photo uh, is all about love and belonging. This photo is about respect. And, you know, you know if you're the kid, you want to be invited to another kid's party. It helps you feel that, that self-worth and respect that you get from being part of the group. And then this is a mindfulness class somewhere in the world. I don't know where. Ah, <laughs> I pretty much gave it away. I'll quickly go in case no one noticed the, uh, the triangle there. But does, it, so does everyone know what these relate to? And I guess what that triangle is. Yes, 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 thank you. So this triangle represents Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's been around for... 30, 40 years now, and I guarantee you will see it in future presentations, so sorry. Um, <laughs> this may be the first time that you guys have seen it, which is nice. Um, it's, been, it's used to prove a lot of points, but fundamentally, Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of looks at what it is that humans need at each stage of their evolution and each point of their, their being, essentially. So, Fundamentally, you need physiological sustenance. You need food, you need water, you need shelter. And then once that condition has been uh, met, you then need safety. You need safety in numbers, you need personal safety. And once that condition has been met, you start looking up. You look to love and belonging, and you want these deep-seated feelings of humanity. And once those have been met, once you've found a partner, for example, or a best friend, you then start looking a little bit more inwardly and you want esteem, you want to feel good about yourself, you want respect. And then if all of those conditions have been met, you want self-actualization, you want to feel spiritual, at one with the world, you want to feel beyond just good, you want to feel um, this idea that you are, 
you know, almost more than yourself, I guess. And so those three things, those three pictures of events, all kind of map back to these different hierarchy of needs. So way back in the, you know, way back in the prehistoric times, events would help meet our physiological and our safety needs to an extent. And now events, I think, really help meet our love and belonging needs, our needs for respect and esteem, and even to the point um, that events will help with self-actualization. So I think events map to all of these deep-seated human needs, essentially. And so I think that they're going to be important for a long time to come, even in the context of digital. So, you know, there's been, uh, there's been a lot of studies around how digital media and social media can make us feel more isolated and alone, which is weird. It's kind of counterintuitive. You'd think that if you're connected with a lot of people online, that you're messaging people, that you can talk to someone um, anywhere in the world at any time of day, you'd never really feel alone and you'd feel part of this bigger world, this bigger society. And yet, in trans it doesn't quite work out that way. If you're just living a digital life, if you only have online friends, you actually start to feel isolated and you feel less happy. And so I think that as fast as digital is changing our world and it's changing the way we interact with our world, it's nowhere near going to change the way we fundamentally need to operate as humans. And that is with connect, a, a physical and human connection with other people. And I think this quote says it really, really well for me. It's quite a long one, but let me just pause so I have a drink of water for a minute while you read this. Okay, so that's a very, it's a very, very specific quote for a very, very specific um, use case. But I think it, for me, it really translates as it doesn't matter how many tools, how good they become for connecting with people online. I'm always going to feel better about doing that in real life. So you can, you know, you can watch a gig online. You can watch it through Periscope. It can be live streamed straight to YouTube but it's never going to replace the feeling of actually being there with your mates. And similarly, you can have a chat to someone in America today after this uh, and connect with them and build up a nice relationship and a good rapport. But unless you get on a plane and you go and meet them, and you shake their hands and you have a coffee or you have, have a beer at the bar, that relationship just will not be as strong as with those that you can do that with. And that's why, you know, that's why businesses still spend a huge amount of money to go and be there in, you know, physically to do sales meetings, to go to conferences, to go to events. Technology might be there, but it's not enough. And so events, to my mind, will continue to be an incredibly important part of the economy for, you know, for many years to come. Okay, so let's just talk very quickly about some of the tools of the trade, some of the things I use um, a lot. It's not all of these. Um, this is a really cool infographic, though. It's actually just come out about a week ago. So this is the 2016 edition from Chief Martech, uh, which is Chief Content, basically Chief Marketing Technology Officer. I don't think that position really exists, but it, the blog exists. And this guy has been compiling these, I think, since 2007, when the first one only had like 120 on. This has now got 3,874 different technology company, different bits of technology, all the stuff that digital marketers will be using on a frequent basis. Like, it's absolutely incredible. So just kind of soak that in. You know, if you go on to work in digital technology, and particularly digital marketing, you will very likely be using a good handful of these tools. Distilling it down, these are some of the tools that I use on a day, like basically a daily basis. Um, certainly not all of them, but it's the majority of the ones I use frequently. Um, do you guys, like, just show of hands, do you guys recognize, like, more than half of them? Yeah? Cool. So they're, they're obviously, I think some of the newer ones, things like Blab, BuzzSumo is relatively new, Slack is relatively new, 
uh, while others have obviously been around for quite a long time, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, MailChimp, Feedly's been a lot around for a long time, although it remains quite niche. That's the, the green uh, green icon. And there's a Q&A session after, so if anyone wants to ask me about any of them, then feel free. I'm not going to dive into all of them because there's just too many. Um, so I'm going to pick out five, five tools that aren't actually on this slide to talk to, and just a little bit more depth. So the first one is, of course, Eventbrite. I organize events as part of my job. You know, it's very, very important, I think, to bring the community together in, you know, in real life. So event professionals need to meet just like anyone else offline. And so for all the digital marketing that I do, all the content marketing that I do, actually probably one of the most impactful things that I do um, is run live events. Run one a month, some, uh, usually in London, for roughly 150 or so people. And I cannot tell you how impactful they've been over the last two years. And we weren't actually doing that until I arrived, uh, which is kind of odd. Um, so, you know, an Eventbrite obviously is the tool I use to help organize these events. And it's just so incredibly easy to use. Again, quick show of hands. How many people have used it as an organizer to organize an event? So just a couple of you. Okay, interesting. How many people have used it as an attendee? Okay, more. Cool. I, I hope you'll agree that it's reasonably easy to use. It's by no means perfect, right? That's why we employ 250 or so engineers to sit in San Francisco all day, every day, and make it better. It's never going to be perfect. There's no such thing as perfection. But I think we do a pretty good job. And 10 years in, we are the market leader. Um, and really, no one else can hold a stick to, to the, just the ease of which um, Eventbrite uh, makes running events, essentially. Um, I won't, again, I won't go into all the technical details of, of why it's so easy, but you know, if you try and run an event, let's say for 200 people, let's say it's a conference, and you need to try and register those 200 people, and you need to understand what their food options are, what they're excited to see, why they've signed up, where they've signed up from so that you can be more successful next year, and you try and do that using email and Excel, you will drive yourself insane. Um, it's, and you know, you won't be doing it very long. Like it's very, very tough to amalgamate all that information. So what you really need to do is, a is have a cloud solution like Eventbrite, there are other options out there, um, but it just makes what is quite a manual task incredibly simple. And I, you know, if you ever do organize an event, I'd obviously encourage you to, to check it out. It takes like less than five minutes to sign up and get your event online. I think Google Analytics is another tool that I use very, very several times a day, all day. Um, again, quick show of hands, who's used Google Analytics? Okay, not too many people. Um, so Google Analytics, if you do go into almost any kind of digital enterprise, like this is pretty much the first tool you should set up and get access to at, at your company. It's gonna tell you all kinds of interesting things. So it's gonna tell you where you're getting traffic from to your website. It's going to tell you what people are doing while on that website. It's going to tell you which pages people don't like because they're leaving to go and do something else. It's going to tell you which pages they do like because they are taking action that you want them to take, whether that's downloading a report or signing up for your service or buying shoes, like whatever it is that your site is about. Google Analytics is a great way to tell you all of these things. Um, it tells you a whole bunch more as well. It's an, it's an extremely... It's actually an extremely simple and intuitive tool to use, which is why it's so widely adopted. Uh, plus it's free, which always helps. Um, but it's also a very in-depth tool. So as you become more expert in it, it it's kind of like layer, layers of an onion. It gets more and more impactful the more you learn about it. So this is a tool that I use all, all the time. I'm still, I still feel like I'm a beginner with it. There's so much more I can learn, but I'm pretty proficient at it. Um, and it does yield so many interesting insights. So Google Analytics, if you're going into digital marketing, or to be honest, digital anything, is probably going to be a fact of life. And then WordPress. So WordPress is a content marketing system. Um, did I say content marketing? Content management system. Um, it's, again, the biggest, I guess, the biggest boy in the playground. I think 27% of all websites on the internet use WordPress, which is quite staggering when you think how many, word, uh, word, uh, how many sites there are on the internet. Um, so it's incredibly widely adopted, and that's just because it's so powerful. Um, it's very, uh, 
you know, the word is extensible, I guess. You can add lots of plugins, you can add lots of functionality to it. So as a basic CMS, it's okay, but when you start layering in other functionality and other plugins that people develop, it can become this incredible full-featured thing. You can turn it into whatever you want. You can turn it into a social network, you can turn it into an e-commerce site, you can keep it as a simple blog, you can add uh, lead generation plugins to it, you can add Google Analytics to it, you can pretty much do what you want to it. So I spend a lot of time, a lot of time in WordPress, working with WordPress, adding plugins, learning about new plugins. Um, and one thing I would say is it helps to know front end in particular coding, like you'll get more out of it if you know some basic coding, basically. Um, so WordPress is another tool that I use like all day, every day. And then Hootsuite is a communications tool at heart. So this helps me manage multiple social media accounts all in one dashboard. So I can manage Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Pinterest. I don't think it, it doesn't have Instagram yet. I wouldn't know because we actually don't do Instagram marketing at Eventbrite for organizers at this point. Um, but it's incredibly useful to have everything in one go. Again, it's got lots of plugins, it's extensible, so you can add more functionality to it as is necessary. Um, and yeah, I find it an incredibly useful tool to manage all of my communications and social media accounts. I, you know, it notifies me whenever someone mentions about Eventbrite, someone needs a customer service inquiry, um, and they send it to any of our social media accounts, I'm notified about it on Hootsuite. So a very, very useful tool that again, I use all day, every day. This one I use slightly less, but I love to give it some love, because I just think it's a really cool free tool. It's called Canva. And if you're not very good at design, like me, reference back to Xavi, um, it's an incredibly useful tool that helps you be a little bit better at design, and it's entirely free. So if Photoshop is impenetrable to you, as it is to me, um, honestly, I'd probably advise you learn Photoshop, and I do, it's on my list of things to do. But in the interim, Canva allows you to create event flyers, posters, banner ads, um, PDF documents, emails, uh, templates, you name it entirely for free, uh, incredibly easy to use, and I just absolutely love this tool. Um, it's made my life, again, an awful lot easier uh, and quicker, and it means I can circumvent where necessary um, you know, professional design, um, because it, it looks pretty good, even to an amateur. Okay, so there's some of the tools of the trade that I use. I realize time's getting on, so I'm gonna um, sort of go, go into this last section now. So the future. Future always makes anyone who talks about the future wrong. So that's why there's definitely a question mark on here. I obviously don't know the future any more than anyone else does, um, but I do have some thoughts on it, um, particularly regards to uh, like digital careers. So fundamentally, I think this intersection of humanity and technology is a rich area, which is you know exactly where Eventbrite is. It's, com it's combining technology to deliver a more human experience. And you can take with that kind of what you will, but essentially as we become a more digitized society and things become, uh, you know, things continue to go into the cloud and online, um, you know, things like uh, artificial intelligence start to um, break into the mainstream, robotics, uh, the internet of things, like all these kind of big, big fundamental technology changes that are gonna disrupt our lives over the next 10, 20 years. If you can think about how do you add a human element to it, how do you humanize this technology, um, that I think is a really rich area. So something that Eventbrite's doing very well um, and hopefully something that you guys can think, ah, there's a technology, but it really requires a human element to, to, to make it more serviceable. <laughs> and then these three trends, I do believe will continue to be important. I do think live experiences you can't disintermediate live experiences. Like it's, it's just not something you can get around. No matter how many tools, you know, you don't, you're not going to want to go to an event, probably, again, this is where I'll be, you know, this will be found in 10 years' time, so you go, ha, he said this will never happen. Um, but you know, it's unlikely you're gonna to want to go to a talk and see a robot talking about you know, digital, um, necessarily. Uh, maybe that's kind of cool, bad example. <laughs> Um, but you know what I mean, like having a, a human touch and live experiences is going to continue to be really important. And then I do think meaningful content, like good, essentially just good quality content, valuable, unique, is going to be 
constantly important. Bill Gates called this, I think, in 1990. He said, the internet is going to be about content. And sure enough, it has been about content um, pretty much since its inception. And I think it will continue to be about content. People want to be entertained. They want to be educated. And how else can they get that other than through content? And so if you can continue to figure out how content will evolve within the digital sphere, I think you're going to, again, um, you know, it's going to be difficult to disrupt that. Um, just, uh, you know, and aside from that, computers can write serviceable content now. I was quite scared to see that the New York Times published an article that was entirely written by a, an algorithm and no one knew. Like, that's kind of scary. So it is going, you know, doesn't mean that robots and AI aren't going to be able to recreate content, but can they create meaningful content in the same way, the same humour, the same... Um, human aspects that we can as people, I think that's going to be slightly more difficult. They'll be able to create technical documents, but not necessarily um, in the same way that we can write fun, fun stuff. And then finally, technology. Clearly, like technology is continuing to drive the world forward. And if you can figure out how to be a master of technology rather than on the sidelines and disrupted by it, then that's going to stand you in very good stead as well. And so finally, you know, the four things that I'm going to be talking to my daughters about in terms of their education beyond the, the, the basic curriculum is to try and really focus on these four areas. I'm going to be such a boring dad, aren't I? <laughs> um, but communication is one of them. You know, communication is just going to be something that, that stays fundamentally important, I believe. Probably forever. You're going to have to be a good communicator, whether that's written, whether that's through... Um, documentation, whether that's in person speaking at events, or whether it's giving d difficult feedback to a colleague or, or a, um, you know, someone in your team, being good at communication is going to serve you well constantly throughout your career in almost every context. Design is another really important thing, but design doesn't just mean creating nice logos and using Canva. Design's a much broader thing. It's about design thinking. And design thinking is really all about putting yourself in your users' shoes or your customers' shoes. Uh, it's about user experience. Um, and if you can really have that empathy with other humans and with other people, with your customers, with your users, with your leads, that design thinking is going to serve you very, very well. And then all of these, all these pieces of software, all this technology, one of the offshoots of that is data. Just tons and tons and reams of data and so a lot of people talk about big data, big data, you know, we live in a world of big data. If you can figure out how to analyze data, again, how to put the human touch to that technology output, you'll be in very, very good stead. You know, data scientist was not really a career, I, I don't believe, 10 years ago. And yet now it's a very, very lucrative career that all the big tech companies want to hire for. So if you can learn to get really good at analysis and understanding data, that's going to stand you in very good stead. And then finally, of course, it's an obvious one, but if you can learn to use and manipulate technology at a basic level, if you can get good at programming, that's going to stand you in very good stead. Whether it's just on a light touch way, you know, knowing HTML and CSS, or really diving deep and learning something like machine learning, for example, which is kind of one of the next big waves of programming uh, and, and career development, it's good to have some understanding of why technology does stuff what technology does and how it works under the hood, it will stand you in very good stead. Thank you, that's it. Um, before we move on to questions, so I'd urge you to be thinking about your questions if you haven't got them already. Um, I just want to say some things that I just thought, firstly that was brilliant, and I think while we're sitting here, I think we need to remember just how lucky we are to be able to be a part of a university and listen to great speakers who are experts in their field and who are physically present, which <laughs> yes. we're very happy about as well. Um, and also, it's brilliant about having speakers in from the digital world, world and the digital design world is we get super slick presentations. <laughs> because us lecturers, we kind of, we're, we're, we're a bit PowerPointy, and our students are just like, oh, gosh. So to have this, now you set the bar, so now I'm going to have to <laughs> just get loads of pictures and make my lectures so much better. So Thanks. you have put the pressure on slightly. Um, what I really liked about what you were saying was that content must be meaningful. 
And we say that every single day as lecturers as well, as your content needs to be meaningful in your essays, whatever you do in your assignments. We don't want all the blurb and the other quotes from other people. We want to know what you have to say. And it's the same thing here. What you do must be meaningful and have meaning to you and the people that read it, which I thought was really powerful. Um, and also, the thing about the real-life events versus the digital is really interesting, and I've had many dissertation students doing that topic. Mm -hmm. So trying to find out whether the digital experience, whether you're experiencing a live uh, event through Twitter is as meaningful as being there yourselves. Yeah. So it is something that's establishing in academic fields as well. So cool. that's brilliant. So thank you so much. Um, right, let's have some questions. Obviously Mark's come a long way to be here, so I'm hoping we've got a few. Who would like to start? Thank you, Lauren. Great question. Um, so, and I, and I actually, when I knew nothing about programming, I spent ages researching it to try and figure it out, and I didn't really know where to start. So you've kind of, you've got two fundamental types of programming language, I guess. So one is your front end, and that manipulates what you can see on a website. So uh, often known as like the user interface. And there's three kind of key parts to that, which is HTML. And that kind of helps add structure to a page. So it tells you know, the, the computer essentially where, you know, where to put your content. We've got CSS, which essentially says how it should look. So that's your different colors and your different designs and how a banner would look and a button would look and that kind of stuff. Then you've got JavaScript, which is now actually crossing the divide. So it does, you can do a lot in the back end with JavaScript as well. That, that adds functionality so you can do things with JavaScript, essentially. So they're like the three key elements to the front end, and then the back end is just like this huge world of, of different programming languages. Um, so Eventbrite is built off um, Python, a language called Python, uh, which has a, a framework called Django. I learned Ruby, which is a language, and the framework within that is called Rails, it's Ruby on Rails. Um, that was cool. I really liked it. It was accessible. It was really powerful. You can do a lot with it. Um, you know, and, and the programming community is a passionate one. So you will definitely have people that say it's the worst thing in the world and it's crap and you shouldn't use it. And other people say it's the best thing since sliced bread. Um, but I would say that's, that was a good language for me. I, I'm not great at maths and logic particularly. You know, I didn't, didn't do them at A level, didn't do them at university. And so programming can be a bit impenetrable when you start talking about logic. Um, and yeah, I found it accessible. So for me, I, the front end's the fun part because you can see things change. You can go into, you can go into um, you know, your script editor and change the main and suddenly your entire page has gone from white to blue or you know, whatever uh, it is that you're doing. That's very satisfying. So I think front end's a great place to start because it gives you such instant feedback. Whereas with backend, you can spend a week on one tiny project or one tiny thing and it still won't work and you just you tear your hair out. But again, the, the satisfaction level when you do figure that out is, is massive. So um, it's, it's kind of what you want to achieve, but I, I would probably start with front-end languages because they're a little bit easier, a little bit more accessible. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript's incredibly powerful now, so I would definitely try and add that on as the, the next thing to learn. And then... If you're enjoying it, maybe dive into a back-end language. Can't keep you busy after you've graduated, you? <laughs> <laughs> And there's loads, sorry, there's, I was just going to say there's so many great resources out there to learn, uh, which is one of the things I really liked about Ruby on Rails, and would be another decision um, to make sure there's lots of education online and examples online to help you learn. Um, so there was a great, it was called Railscasts, and that was just a series of videos that taught you how to do very specific things in Ruby on Rails, and it was just a lifesaver. Like without that, I wouldn't have got anywhere near as far. Um, and then there's things like General Assembly. I don't know if you know those guys, but I went, I did one of their actual classes, and um, they're based in London, so it'd be a bit more difficult to get to from Lincoln, but they have lots of online stuff as well. Um, so yeah, there's so much, there's a wealth of online learning basically out there. So that's, just make sure you've got enough to help support you if you're gonna go and learn a language, I would say. So. Any other questions? Uh, we, uh, 
against that. So as well, people like us would take you probably would just go quietly and join us at some point. If you wanted to sort of learn um, or have something on the TV, get you into that. Yeah. That's a really good question. So, how, how, basically, how to get into pro, programmatic marketing or yeah, just that, digital that, in general? That, and also, just sort of like thinking about the future, it would probably be automated. Yeah. So where would you go to try and create a business with? Yeah, so two great questions. Um, I'll take the, the last part, yeah. which is what career might not be replaced by robots. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest, like it's tough, it's scary, like because I read a lot about AI and robotics, and it's just unbelievable. Like every time there's a milestone set that people say will never be beaten, it's beaten, and you know, in a, in a, in a more rapid way. Um, and now, you know, the people are saying lawyers are going to be out of jobs in the next ten years because because robots can do a better job of reading case studies and and, and reasoning arguments out of it. Even doctors, you know, doctors that. And surgeons, like what an incredibly complex field. But Watson, IBM's Watson, is actually helping doctors make diagnoses. How long is it it's going to go from helping them to just being that 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 diagnosis? Possibly never though, because you want as a human, you want to go and you want to speak to another human. And so even if the, the, the robot does all the hard work um, and, and makes a more accurate diagnosis, you're probably still always going to want to go up with a doctor. And you're always going to want to know if, it, if that machine failed, that you've got a, an educated professional there to kind of second guess it. Um, so I don't know whether there's going to be any career. Like going back to the Uber example, like all those Uber drivers have now got a new job and taxi drivers are, are in, you know, in a difficult space. But you know, you've got Google self-driving cars, Uber's working on self-driving cars. Like, Who'd have thought that you could have a self-driving car that can drive all the way from one end of Europe to another without having a single crash? Like that's just mind blowing. So I don't like everything you think is unable for a computer to do. Like I, I would suggest it's it's going to be able to be, be it's going to be able to do it. The question is like, are you going to need a, a person next to it working with it? And I think that's the key. And I, think, and I think that will remain important for lots and lots of jobs, including digital marketing, right? Because you can, the, a computer can spit all the data out and kind of tell you what, what it thinks it should do, but unless you know why, it, it could be giving you the wrong answer. Does that, does that make sense? So there's a, there's a book out by Martin Lindstrom um, called Small Data, and this is his whole argument, which is you can have all the data in the world but actually it might point you in the wrong direction and you, you're pretty much always going to need a human to, to translate and, and educate that data. Um, and so that's, that's going to be the same with digital marketing, I think. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. It's, it, honestly, like, I don't want to be a downer. It's, it's a really scary prospect and obviously we're still, there will still be jobs out there, um, but, but being able to predict which is not going to get disrupted by a computer, that's really difficult. And then in terms of like, what experience to have um, for... I mean, for programmatic marketing, we've, like, most people outsource that to an agency. Um, and so I don't know the, all the ins and outs about it, other than the fact it's very, very data-driven, again. Like, you, you're always looking for that arbitrage. You're always trying to figure out where you can get that slight edge and spend slightly less money than your competitor uh, and find a slightly better fit for your advert and, and segment your audience just that little bit more tightly again. Um, so it's really just, that's like a series of A-B tests over and over and over again, basically to try and figure out what's the, what's the optimal language, what's the optimal colour, what's the optimal placing of it, at what time, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and that, that's a human, again, using all these, these data mining uh, tools to figure that out. Um, mm -hmm. So to get something like that on, on your CV, I mean, when, when, when I'm hiring, I'm always looking for people who are doing interesting stuff fundamentally, right? So it's, when you come out of uni, it's difficult to have that all that work experience like in very relevant things. You could probably get some at an agency would be one, one help, but I'm definitely looking for people who've launched side projects and got their own blog or done a project or done a course or you know, built something, essentially. Like for me, that gets me really excited and says, you know, something's really 
entrepreneurial and really innovative. And so for me, like having side projects on your CV is probably the best way to stand out because most people won't have side projects. And it was definitely only by doing Zavi, which wasn't a side project, it was meant to be, <laughs> um, that, that really got me in the door at Eventbrite. You know, making that leap from conferences to digital probably wouldn't have happened. Um, so I, ha I had to take a big drastic step, but if you can do it as a side project, it's, it's a little safer. So you might swap in about five minutes. I've okay. heard of students who have loads of questions. Sure. Not yet. Okay. Okay. Um, can we just thank Mark once again for coming in today? We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.